Welcome to the ClassCast Podcast, where philosophy, policy, pedagogy, and people come together in honest, purposeful conversations about improving school and education for our students and our communities. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins, an award-winning English teacher, speaker, tutor, and podcast host in Northern Virginia. You can listen and subscribe to the ClassCast Podcast on all major streaming services, on YouTube, and at ClassCastPodcast.com. Ladies and gentlemen, class is in session. Welcome to the ClassCast podcast. I'm your guest, Simon Tang, and today, Ryan Tibbins, host of the ClassCast podcast, English teacher, one of my favorites, a hot sauce producer, crazy man, jack of all trades, will be talking to me. Ryan, thanks for having me on the show. How are you doing? I, I am doing great. And Simon, that was that was fantastic. Both well done as a listener of the, of the show, and for anyone who knows you, say, through school, seems perfectly fitting that you did the uh, introduction rather than than me. Um, so all right, let's let's for for those who don't know you, you know, uh, let, let's give a little background. So, so I taught Simon in 11th grade, uh, AP English language and composition, Part though. Of it, but... What's that? Well, well, you know, we got most of the year, we got three quarters of that year, that was, that was the 2019 2020 year. Uh, and then Simon just graduated. And so uh, we've had a lot of discussions about education. And so I thought you'd be a great guest. And we also have sort of a limited timeline before you're going to be, you know, uh, you know, gone for a little while. We won't we won't have access to you. So we'll let you talk about that. But your sort of experience in school is probably a little different than most students. And so I'm going to give a very basic setup and I want you to explain sort of how this goes. Right. So the reason I said that Simon, it was great that he did the introduction is because uh, Simon has never really just been a student, but has also, you know, for lots of technical and and legal reasons has fallen short of being a teacher. But uh, so Simon has done all kinds of stuff at the, at the school that we both worked at and attended, et cetera, uh, far beyond what you would normally expect from a student um, at, to the point where, you know, Maybe, maybe perhaps this young man has tried to take some liberties with the uh, faculty lounge or the teacher workrooms and things like that, which became a sticking point. But uh, so Simon, you, you explain sort of what was your role in the school? Like how has your experience been different than the average student? So I'd like to call myself a technology paraprofessional uh, for the better part of the last six years, two at the middle school, four at the high school. Uh, I've worked alongside what we now call them the digital experience team. Um, for, in layman's terms and for the rest of the, I guess, world that uh, isn't Loudoun County Public Schools, the school's IT team. Uh, and so I've done a lot of Chromebook inventory, uh, maintenance, tier one technical support, uh, just like this, uh, you know, support technician to end user uh, type of support. So, yes, um, but that that does not fully describe it though. Right. Because, uh, you know, I, I remember freshman year when you arrived in the school, you know, like first week of high school, that might've thought... been a culture shock for a lot of the, the school. I mean, it, 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 just imagine someone walking in with a pocket protector, which I'm not wearing now, but you know, something that <laughs> most people haven't seen since the eighties or maybe ever, um, yeah, rocking rocking the pocket protector, the well organized <laughs> pens. But I mean, freshman year, didn't you carry a briefcase instead of a backpack? Like, I, no, I had a backpack. I had a backpack. Are you sure? All right. Well, I yeah. just, I just remember um, I remember thinking like that's that's a really short substitute teacher, and it took a little <laughs> while before I realized that you were a student and not you know not an employee. And that was that was you know a first couple of weeks of freshman year. Um, you also got to know, I don't know how long it took you, but you got to know pretty much the entire teaching staff, uh, not only better than I did, but, you know, like fast and would would very, you know, cordially say hello to people walking around the hallways. Like what prompted that? Like what, what made that a, a, an important thing for you to get to know everyone in the building like that? Being bold. Um, not only that, but uh, at, at the middle school, uh, you know, going through the ranks, going through the motions, uh, in a similar fashion, I got to know most of the people there. I was doing most of the same stuff um, at the middle school also. So just same, same thing, different place, new faces, um, but really not all that different. 
to be honest with you. Okay. I, I'm a firm believer that, um, you know, it's important to get to know everyone from the principal uh, to the custodial staff. Uh, you never know uh, who your friends are going to be. You never know when you might need X, Y, Z from any one of those individuals. And uh, I think it's served me well for the past six or so years. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I, I say this a lot to people, but I I think that the most important people in a school, aside from the students, are the uh, front office staff, like thinking the the secretaries and, and all that, and the custodians. You know, after that, yeah, maybe then you want to get to know a principal, but the people who really, you know, <laughs> literally and metaphorically hold all the keys to everything in the building, you know, make things happen. It's 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 those people in those roles. Um, and yeah, but no, you you did, and you got I, to know everyone with that, and I, I think it it probably paid off a lot of ways, right? I mean, both. I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you how many times I've needed a custodian to unlock a door and it's happened without any questions asked, uh, probably because I'm one of the few students and probably one of the few people in the building altogether to try to get to know them at all. Yeah. Um, and not to diss some of your colleagues here, but I feel like there's, uh, there's some sort of a divide or at least some sort of a bubble between the students, the teachers, and perhaps some of the support staff, like the custodians uh, in the building that, that, you know, I, I guess the groups intermingle uh, when necessary, but not always, or not, at yeah. least not intentionally. You're right. You're right. You sort of occupy like different, it's not different worlds. It's like different continents within the same world though. Um, you know, and I've had, a, I, especially when I was younger, I used to be at school late a lot. Even even in the yeah. last few years, I'm still one of the last teachers in the building, but I'm gone, you know, say five thirty, six o'clock. You know, my first few years teaching, I would be at the school until nine, ten o'clock. And some some of the most interesting and, and useful conversations I've probably ever had, at least ever had in a school, were with the night staff custodians who would come into my room. They don't, you know, you can only come in so often or so many times before it goes beyond saying hello and you actually have, have a chat. Right. Uh, but right. I, you know, I also feel weird about those sometimes because there are people who I see a lot who I don't have that conversation with and I always feel weird about it. And it, part of it's because I don't, I don't speak any Spanish. And so uh, from a couple of the custodians have limited English. And so they seem very friendly, but I'm like, Oh, you know, but that, that's right, weird. And right, so, right. and I, I like the way you explain that because that's, that's sort of where you're at. And that's, that's why I thought that some of your, your perspectives and ideas would, would be, would be good oh. because you, sort of bridge some of those gaps between the teacher and the student, the student, the staff, the support staff, the teacher, et cetera. You found a way to occupy all of those spheres or all of those different, different groups. Uh, what, what does that make school look like to you? It makes it look like a job. Um, I feel like, well, let me put it to you this way. When I leave that, when I used to leave the house in the morning to go to school, school, I used to say in my house, I'm going to work or I'm going to the office. I'll see you later. <laughs> um, and honestly, I don't think, or at least my parents uh, over time have just stopped questioning what I mean when I say the office altogether. Uh, they kind of get the drift that, you know, there's probably more to it than just uh, sitting in class and listening to the teacher lecture and taking the notes. Um, not that I, not that I, share too much about what goes on in the school building because that might uh that might make them start asking questions that i quite frankly uh don't really want to hear at the end of the day uh, or answer at the end of the day i'm like a curmudgeon uh, yeah at this point that's a good that's um, a good word i think that's appropriate um <laughs> so, just, just out, of, out of curiosity because you know you're a, a very successful and high performing student uh generally you know i think i think well, very well liked in the building and, and all this. Kind I don't of stuff. know about that part, but we'll go. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think that is that is mostly true. There, there are a few exceptions, but not many. Um, and useful. <laughs> well, you know, that's a good way to get people to like you, though. So how much did your parents have to do with that? Like it, it just you, you just graduated with what, like a, a 5000 GPA or something. You know, you're in the top. What were you top uh, top five percent top? A very highly inflated four point six five. Um, and, and since you brought up the class rank of GPA, I was, t I was tied for number 10, uh, with another classmate. Uh, I was in the top 5%, but barely, uh, I don't know. You, you do the math, um, what 10 out of 388. I can't, I can't. My GPA wasn't good enough. I can't <laughs> um, do that math. <laughs> that, um... And, uh, and 
quite frankly, I, at the beginning of senior year, so back in September of 2020, I was in speed, I was in slot number 23, okay. something like that. And then by January, I rose to slot 18. And then by the end of the year, I was number 10. Uh, okay. I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that's an indication of my brains or the fact that people just stopped using them towards the end of the year. So, well, um, you know, what? it's like, it's like a war of attrition. You know, you see last man standing. I, I had my best grades in all of high school, senior year, especially in the second half of senior year, because everybody else sort of takes their foot off the gas and coasts. And I yeah, just kept doing yeah. what I was doing, you know, which wasn't, I, 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 you know, I was a good student, but I didn't work that hard in high school. Um, but I just didn't let off. And so all of a sudden, like my grades were like climbing and I'm like, what is going on? I think it had a lot to do with other people sort of, you know, so, lo losing the motivation or focus. So let me ask you this. Um, I know at least in Loudoun County where we're working slash attending school, uh, we have a lot of dual enrollment programs now, or at least it's building up. Did you have those when you were growing up going through high school? I did not. Um, I think there were a few students who did. Um, but most of it, I want to say, was like math once they got beyond whatever someone could teach in the building. So Oof. as far as I recall, yeah. there were a few students who did some dual enrollment work. Um, where I went to school in Pennsylvania, though, it was it was AP, like you took AP classes. So um, there, there wasn't a lot of dual enrollment that I, I remember anyway. Um, but I, I mean, I think it's a good opportunity. I mean, and you took advantage of at least some of that, right? All of my classes, with the exception to AP Calculus AB, during my senior year were dual enrollment. So I didn't really have the choice to lift my foot off the gas uh, because all of those classes show up as college courses through the local community college on the college transfer. Uh, so do you think that that was a good decision? I mean, financially, it's nice to get you ahead. Do you think that you got... Well, I'm asking an unfair question because you haven't been to college yet, but do you think you got an approximately, you know, college level class in, in each of those? Like, did, was that was that legitimate? You know, I'm going to flash back to a conversation we had at the previous school year where we were talking about AP Lit versus uh, English 12 dual enrollment and where you said English 12 dual enrollment would be easy. You were not wrong. <laughs> it was I, easy. To um, clarify, I believe I said easier, but yes, it was going to be, it was going to be easy compared to my class and easier than, than AP lit, but yeah. And, and the other dual enrollment classes that, uh, that I was taking were relatively easy also, uh, dual enrollment government, I, as a, as a hobby more so than a professional goal, I've been interested in that, uh, for a long time. So that made it really easy. Uh, and I was also at the Academies of Loudoun, which is our, I guess, magnet school would be a word yeah. or two to use there. Um, I was doing the, uh, or I was attending rather the cybersecurity program over there, which was all dual enroll. Um, so okay. that's, and then that, that kind of feeds off of what I was doing at the school on the other days, which was tech support and, and, and the like. Um, right. So now, it made it really easy for me there. You know, and, and, so you have that experience and you have, you know, a bunch of college credits, 50 something. College so credits. you're, you're almost am, halfway through college. <laughs> I am just one class short, a humanities class short of an associates in general studies. Um, I'm actually, before we started this recording, I was actually in the middle of an application to apply with a certificate from the community college, which is just a step below the associates. Um, and I'm three classes short from an associates in IT. Okay. So is that, is that something you're going to try to pursue? That's yeah, I think that's the plan. And uh, to use those credits to transfer to another college, uh, probably something online, just because of what my situation is going to look like uh, over the next however many years of my life. Right. So, um, all right. So before we talk about that, because I mentioned, you know, I had a limited timeline to, to get you on, on the podcast uh, before we, we reveal that mystery of, you know, he's not going to prison. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> not exactly. I argue I've spent 13 years there. But there anyway. Well, we're getting to that, too. But um, one of the things I think that was really interesting and impressive and and I, probably a surprise to you, it seemed like it. But you also 
came into a large quantity of scholarships and I, you don't, I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot about the dollar value oh. exactly, but you received the faculty scholarship, which one graduating senior gets each year. Uh, you're welcome for me talking you into attending graduation. Cause it would have been weird if you weren't there. Uh, he, it would have been very weird. Um, yeah, he, he but... didn't want to go. I had to, I had to guilt trip him in. I'm sure I was not the only one. I'm sure you got a lot of that. Um, but you also got, some other scholarships, including one from your soon to be or, or your, you know, your employer. So how, how did that come about, you know, for a guy who already has 50 some college credits and who has mixed feelings about formal education. And obviously that's, that's really what we're talking about today, but how did the scholarships come to be? Where did they come from? Like, how, how do you, how do you explain that given that you um, aren't necessarily pursuing them? I wasn't the crazy guy who decided to put me up for the faculty scholarship. So you might be able to answer that better than I. Uh, what I will say is that I, I suspect that a large portion of it has come from what I've done for the past four years at the high school and two years at the middle school, uh, which is saving a bunch of behinds uh, from uh, what seems to be momentary crises that happened in the building. Uh, as for the other scholarship, uh, which came from the United States Navy, uh, I, it, it's it's the the one hundred thousand uh, dollars is really just a some it's really just a sum of all the benefits that come from the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So everyone gets that. Um, I feel like that was more of a recruiting stunt uh, to have the big check and to have all all the other. Uh, people who are enlisting with me on the stage, but uh, you know, do, do you resent it? Do you feel like they were using you? Is that, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I feel like to a degree I've been used since the beginning, uh, but, but I've gotten a lot out of it also. So it's kind of been a symbiotic relationship, if you will. It's good. It's good. So, uh, all right. So we've already hinted at a bunch of this, um, you know, in, in terms of your feelings about school and, and all that, but We've already established that you are both a, a unique and very successful student. You know, you've had a, a different experience than maybe a lot of students do, but you've done very well, et cetera. At what point did you decide that going directly to college after high school was not for you, right? You, you've enlisted in the United States Navy, and I think you're going to do great at it just because you're you're a determined person. Like you're, you're going to be good at whatever you decide uh, you want to be good I'm at. Stubborn. But uh, well, and, th and that may be, that may be one way to describe it. I just, I, I, a lot of people, a lot of my former students who have enlisted, I not with perfect accuracy, but with a pretty solid degree of accuracy, I can say who's going to do well, who's not, who's going to make it, who isn't, et cetera. Uh, I, I don't really have any concerns about you. That being said, if you had told me three weeks into the school year, your junior year, when I taught you, you know, we sort of kind of knew each other, but not real well. If you had said I was going to enlist, I would have laughed at you. I think when you did tell me, I probably <laughs> laughed a little bit anyway, but it was, it was a little less surprising. But so what, what led you to, to the path to enlist in the armed forces, as opposed to go to college, especially since you're only, you know, give or take a year and a half, two years away from finishing. Um, so let me just start that part of the conversation by saying, I don't think I fully committed to this path that I'm on until probably about a couple months after I'd signed the papers that says, yes, I'm going to <laughs> go to great mistakes as some people call it. Uh, I, I didn't commit to it until one day I was rolling into a meeting with the, with basically the entire recruit pool and the recruiters. Uh, and I was called up to, up to the front center uh, future Sailor Tang, front and center, uh, you're being promoted. You are the new commanding officer of the delayed entry program candidates. And my response to that uh, was, quote, I wasn't aware I had a position, unquote. I genuinely did not know that I was uh, this important figurehead. Um, that I, I realized the paradox there, but I didn't realize that I was this uh, individual that people would start looking at to issue commands, to, um, I guess, in some way, shape, or form, mentor some of the other recruits who were there. Um, and I think in part that, I think in part I got to that place because I was the last recruit to leave of the current recruits at the time, uh, me leaving a year later, uh, which is right about now. But so this this is all a year ago, just to put into context. Right. Uh, but I don't think I really committed committed to it in my brain, in my heart, until that moment. 
um, until, until you and, had an actual responsibility. <laughs> right. You're like, oh, right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, this is real now. <laughs> other, right. other people may need me to, to do something here. Right. Do you and think so, they knew that? Do you, I mean, do you think I, that's partially strategic on, on the recruiter's part or on whoever, whoever did that? I think it was a decision that could have gone either way and that worked well, particularly because uh, I'm stubborn. I'm a little bit headstrong. And I'm, if you're going to do something, you ought to do it right. And you ought to do it the first time. Uh, true in all aspects of my life, except for maybe my handwriting, uh, which you can attest to. Uh, but I think in all other aspects of my life, I think that's how I, I kind of roll through the motions. Uh, and so it worked out well. And so that's what I was kind of alluding to when I said it was a symbiotic relationship. Um, they like to, I, I guess they like to use me as the poster child for recruitment. And I use them in the sense that I get to develop some of this leadership and uh, I get to uh, have my, I guess, a, a foot up on some of the other recruits that will be at Great Lakes with me in about okay. a week. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, yeah, it's soon, right? You said it's a soon week. in a week, a week from today, actually. That's all um, right. So very exciting. So by the time this is released, you will already be at basic training, right? Um, I'm assuming so. I don't know how fast you release these. Uh, yeah. Who, who knows these days? <laughs> <laughs> you know, busy, busy, busy days. But yeah, no, you'll 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 be you'll be there. How are you feeling about that? How you feel? I mean, because that's, you know, you're only going to be what, three weeks or whatever before, say, a lot of your your classmates are going to college. So you still have that going away experience. You're going to be in a new environment. Like all of, all of the things, like if you just sort of do a surface level analysis of like, I'm getting out of my house, I'm doing this new thing, I'm meeting new people, that part isn't very different. But what what you're I, going to be doing is going to be very different, right? And so- I think, I think what I'm going to be doing is very different, but I think some of the underlying, uh, some of the underlying- prerequisites or the necessary um, skills or thought processes are more similar than you might think. Um, and we can talk about that in a moment, but uh, uh, what were you saying? I, I, well, I no, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, thinking about like, you know, you're, you're about to leave and it feels like this big shift and, and because it is, but you know, it, you deciding to enlist in the armed forces was a little bit of a surprise. I think for most people, including um, myself, but <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. That, and so, so given that, you know, it, it seems like, Oh, you know, Hey, he made this big decision. He's doing something different. But like you point out, there, there's a lot of similarities, both in terms of the, the going away, but also some of the skills that you're going to use, or you're going to be building. Um, why, like, why, why did you choose military instead of school? Since you've already done all the dual enrollment and all the rest, like, even right, if you're right, like, right, I just right. hate school, you could power through, you could, I mean, the way you work, you could be done in another year, year and a half if you really pushed and maxed out your credits. So why not do that? Like what what made the choice for you to say armed forces is a better route than just going to college immediately? So armed forces was never out of the question. Um, and actually, my original plan was to apply for a, a ROTC scholarship or to the Naval Academy. Uh, but one of the requirements for that application is an SAT or an ACT score. And uh, to make the long story short, when I was scheduled to do it in January of 2020, I couldn't. Uh, and so it got rescheduled for a date in March of 2020. And uh, I bet you and the listeners can figure out how the rest of that story goes. Um, COVID hit. Uh, none of us were aware of what was going on. Most of us thought we might die sooner or later, probably sooner. <laughs> um, and so it kept getting pushed back by the college board. And after a certain point, um, I just said, college board, you know, give me back my $52 and I'll make something else work. Um, so I, I, I decided to stick it to the man, essentially. Uh, do you, I mean, and, and that is true. You know, I, I, as far as I know, the military academies are among, among a relatively small number of schools that are still requiring the tests. Mm -hmm. Most places have gone test optional. A bunch of places have gone test blind. The academies, uh, like I said, to the best of my knowledge, still require it and a handful others uh, along with them. Do you think that that, I mean, obviously we don't know how it's going to play out, but do you think that was a good decision for you to, to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do this a different way. I'm going to take that different path. I think it was a great decision uh, because I'm happier overall as a, as a, as an individual, um, I would still say I'm a curmudgeon, but I'm probably less of a curmudgeon 
uh, than I might have been, say, around this time last year, uh, okay. mainly because I didn't because I didn't have to go through the um, college application process. I didn't have to go through the stress of wondering, well, you know, now that these schools are all test optional, who am I going to get to write the letter of recommendation? Uh, I didn't have to worry about having to ask that, say, over email as opposed to having a conversation first with an individual, something like this, but perhaps probably person to person as opposed to uh, webcam feed to webcam feed. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I did have to spend a lot of time writing a bunch of essays, which is great. Uh, I know you thrive off of that as your side hustle. but That, uh, is, that, is, that is my <laughs> side hustle. And I would have loved to have written a recommendation for you, it would have been, you know, as, as a rule, a letter of recommendation should be no more than a page. And usually you try to keep it to like half to three quarters if you can. But uh, for you, I would have sent them three and told them they just had to suck it up and read it. Uh, so, um, right, so, so let's, 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 let's get into the, the schooling piece of it, right? Because we now have the sense of what you're going to do and, and that you've been successful through school. Um, I also said, as we got started that, you are someone who has listened to the podcast and you and I have had discussions about education, um, say, you know, even outside of class, you know, just between classes, study hall, whatever. Um, I'll, I'll hit you with one of the big questions for the podcast and we'll let this sort of set up the rest of it. But okay, what to you is the purpose of education? And Ooh. just because we've, you and I have talked about some of this before, I'm going to, I'm going to let you sort of double up or handle this how you want. Normally I think about the guests and, and I, I change my words. Sometimes I say, what's the purpose of education? Sometimes I say, what is the purpose of school? I don't think they're the same thing. They're not. But for I... you, and, and you can feel that one, the other, or both, but to you, what's the purpose of what it is, whatever it is we've been doing in school up to this point, what is the purpose of a formal public education or of school itself? Indoctrination. Um, and it's ironic that I say that giving, given what my career path is going to be, but I think, you know, in one word, if I had to choose one word to describe public school, it would be indoctrination. And I say that because from the ages of probably four or five to 12 or 13, I think that's when most kids hit fifth grade, maybe a year or two younger. Um, you're taught how to walk in line. You're taught that the bell means that she switched classes or that at XYZ time when the teacher tells you to, you get up and you move from one room to the other, maybe to the gym for gym, maybe to the music room on Tuesdays and Thursdays for your specials. Um, you're told when lunch is every day at whatever time it is, whether that's 10 o'clock, which is ridiculous, <laughs> but that's just my opinion, or two o'clock, also ridiculous, uh, but again, just my opinion. Um, you're in doctor you're in doctrine from the very beginning. And that changes as you go through, at least um, for the six years, kindergarten through fifth grade, that I was in elementary school, we didn't have bells to dictate class changes, but we effectively had one with the teacher. Um, some couple of them actually had bells, ding, 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 ding. Um, <laughs> you know, and then in middle schools, you know, same thing, right? You, you got a bell that tells you when to move from one class to the other, to the next and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's why I, I and again, I, I made the joke uh, that I've been in prison for the last 13 years, um, but it might not be it might not be an illegitimate comparison. Uh, while I do get to leave the doors of the school building, um, I, I don't get to leave them until 403 for the high school or and, whatever and time it is to, for the elementary and middle. Yeah, and you get to um, take a whole bag of work with you. <laughs> so, right. So I'm, I'm essentially put into confinement in my own home anyway when I'm doing a bunch of work at home or it's like, it's like a work release work. program. It's, <laughs> it's like you're, you're in jail. With, it's like work release. Um, now. Okay. So, but that sounds more like the purpose of school. Right. And, and I would argue by the way, that we both use the phrase public school in there, um, right. which is, is probably a bigger concern. I, I think that most private and charter schools function in similar ways. So that, that might just be a criticism of the way, not everyone, but most people think of school. Education is different. I feel yeah, like this what, is where you're going with it. So yeah, education, yeah, what, what's that about? Education is different, uh, mainly because I think the, the purpose of education is self-improvement. Um, I think you're a firm believer that the more stuff you know, the better we are. Um, with In terms of the graduation and the award ceremony that you alluded to earlier, uh, my 
my saying was more or less, the more I know, the less I understand and the less I know, the more comfortable I am. <laughs> um, you know, just kind of a ironic mantra there. Uh, but I think in general, uh, education is about self-improvement. And I'll give you an example. Uh, granted, even though I did this through the public school system, if you will, um, I think a lot of the education aspects of my senior year came from the Academies of Loudoun, that cybersecurity program, mainly because I was studying it, it, it and the way the teacher ran it, um, it was more like an individual self-study uh, on a Zoom meeting. So you were on a Zoom meeting, but you know, with most people, either with tiles or icons, they might have not been there or there might have been dead bodies behind the screen. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, who knows? Um, Everybody's asleep. <laughs> we were pretty much left to our own devices to you know, read the material, to study, to tinker around if we have um, computer parts or computer hardware at home. And so uh, I learned how to study and I learned to tinker around with stuff that I'm interested in, to explore, if you will. And uh, from that program, I got industry certification from it. I actually got three of them, um, which for, for the IT gurus who might or might not be listening to this, uh, I got uh, the core I, uh, the core CompTIA certs, uh, which is the CompTIA A plus network plus security plus. Uh, those are just to, for, for those listeners who aren't in the IT industry, um, those are three baseline certifications that a lot of employers look for um, from their employees, uh, generally as uh, help desk support, which is what I've been doing for the better part of the last six years, uh, or network administrators, systems administrators, so on and so forth. But uh, what's important about that is that those, at least in the industry, those certifications are gold. And in particular in IT, it's a lifelong learning industry. No one's ever stopping to learn stuff. So um, whether that's me taking notes from a video or maybe uh, reading a textbook about XYZ topics, um, or even something as simple as subscribing to a cybersecurity podcast, and listening to some of the headlines, right? That's all part of the learning uh, process there. It's also about passion. Um, I'm interested in the topic, so I put a lot of effort into learning it. I put effort into the certification to show that, hey, I actually know something. Um, you know, I can compete with these 20-year-olds coming out of college that might or probably more likely don't have the same certifications. I can compete with people who've been in the industry for at least a couple of years and say, Hey, I have these baseline certifications too. give me a shot. Especially, um, especially if you knock out those last three classes and you have the associates in it, I mean, you, you know, right. you're, you're right there. Um, um, and, and, well, just, just real quick, just because the way you said that you make it sound like, you know, if education is about self-improvement in this case, you were learning things that you're interested in. I mean, study skills, independence, plus the actual technical knowledge and, and skills you made it sound like you were learning that almost in spite of school, or maybe it was like, it was coincidental. Like, you know, it just sort of, but if you hadn't been in that program, what's the likelihood that you would have had or sought out those opportunities? Like, uh, you know, we can, we can be critical of school and say that, you know, maybe more people should have the opportunity like you did to say, do a, a magnet program or do something specialized, or maybe to not have to do it through school at all. But thinking, and maybe even think more like, for the average student, which we're going to say you're, you're not for, at least for the purpose of this conversation, but like without for, school there to provide that opportunity or that structure, do you think that you would have done it? Like would, would this I, have happened anyway? I could have gotten the books from the library to be honest with you, because uh, for better or for worse, the online textbooks we were provided, I didn't like them very much. And I ended up using some of my own materials anyway. So the, the materials to do it wasn't necessarily an issue. But what probably would have been an issue for me was the monetary cost involved. Um, just to put into perspective, uh, the first certification that I rattled off, the A plus certification, um, it requires two separate tests, each costing two hundred thirty-two dollars. Um, so take that two hundred thirty-two times two um, for the network plus. Um, I believe that's three hundred thirty-eight dollars, something like that, something in that ballpark. Um, that's only one test, but add that to the 232 times two. And for the security plus, I believe it's 370. So add that to sure what? all I, that. Thousand that's, bucks, a little over a thousand bucks, something like that. Right. And 
I'm a high school student. I don't have a thousand bucks to burn. Um, I mean, well, I shouldn't say burn because it actually, those certifications help me in the end, but I don't have a thousand bucks on my own to spend all that. Um, right. And so I think, I think school gave me the financial support to do it, but in terms of the supplies, like the textbooks or some of the other learning materials, I procured those on my own anyway. Yeah. Um, well, and that, that, I think that happens a lot. Like we just went through a new, you know, textbook adoption process a year well, two years ago now um you know and i i get that like they have in the budget so we need to have the materials and when a new teacher gets hired you have to be able to hand them something but like i don't i don't need it <laughs> like I, you know hey, I you're honestly, in my class we use the textbook for like you know a month at the beginning of school year and then it's the rest of you're like well we, here's all this stuff we can do we don't need that um interesting i mean Interestingly enough, I found a PDF of the entire textbook that we used. Um, and I think I gave it to you just so that you have it in case. Yeah, you I actually it came day. in handy. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> but we only read a chapter of that book. I don't remember how many chapters there were, but it's this thick book. I mean, no one's fooling around here. We're talking about several hundred, if not probably close to a thousand pages. And we only read maybe 30 pages of it. Something um, like that, yeah. So yeah. You, you take the cost of that book times 30, 60, I don't know how many the school has, but a bunch. <laughs> do, do the math and we're barely using them. Um, probably the same thing with some of the other books for the other English classes. Um, I can't even imagine the math classes or the science classes because as far as I know, none of the math, none of the math teachers or at least very few of them actually use their physical textbooks. Right. As far as I know, other than for paperweight. Yeah. Um, and, and I'd argue the Chromebook, I'd argue the Chromebook serves the same function, but that's a different story. Um, but we, we don't, there's, there's certain things that uh, the Chromebook might be a bit different just because of some of the equity issues involved or um, particularly this year because of distance learning. Yeah. Being um, but, but at least for the uh, physical textbooks, most of the teachers, at least from my experience, haven't used them feel like that buddy could be doing other things so so with that real quick then because there's this it's it's weird we do this double talk where i think a lot of teachers a lot of administrators people sort of bad mouth textbooks a little bit like that's the less creative thing to do or that's whatever i mean don't get me wrong a textbook can be useful and i use textbooks for my for my study prep all the time but um I don't know if this is a criticism of your colleagues or what have you, but I've noticed it's just an observation that most of your colleagues don't use them, or at least they yeah. use them very minimally. Well, and, and that's, that's what sort of I was getting at is I think that there's a lot of talk. And I don't know how long this has happened, but I know when I was in college, you know, taking education classes, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, you'll have a textbook and, and you can use it for some things, but there, there was sort of this idea that you shouldn't rely on it too heavily I mean, even in, even, even in though the these college. things are like, well, but these things are like, it's pre-made. It's got this lesson. It's got this worksheet. It's got this, all this stuff sort of done for you. And, and most of the teachers don't use it. And we don't, it. and we won't use it. But I mean, I, it's because I just think my personal belief is that it doesn't necessarily fit the way I want the class to run. And so I have the freedom to do something else. That's fine. But everybody's, everybody talks that way until you get a new textbook. And then all of a sudden, all the people hire her up, like they love the new textbook. And I don't know if it's how much of it's because they really love it, or if it's just like, well, I just, you know, signed off on this multi-million dollar I, expenditure. So they have to pretend they love it. I don't know how that works, but. Um, I have never met a single one of your colleagues who says, I love this textbook. Yeah, I've never met a single <laughs> one who happen. said that. In fact, most of the ones that I've had the balls to ask have said, no, I hate this textbook, yeah. but we're going to use it anyway, because this is what has been provided. So, um, so or there might be other factors like, uh, like Northern Virginia community college, and the dual enrollment programs that require us to use you right, know, XYZ right. textbook, XYZ materials. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes you get, you get hemmed in like that a little bit, but I'm just thinking that if, if one of the biggest advantages to you was sort of having the public funding to support getting these certifications. And, and, you know, you said, I didn't love the materials we were given. So into the library, but again, that comes back to a public funding piece, not, not through schools, but it same, same basic sort of operation or, you know, funding. 
that's one of the places where I get stuck on this idea about sort of throwing it all away. You know, um, the episode that I, I released at the beginning of season three of the podcast, which is the, the round table discussion mm -hmm. uh, of a bunch of other teachers. And that that's a big part of that discussion, you know, and I brought it up and I said, look, all these things that we just said, you know, is this round table of on innovation with teachers from all over the country, uh, all over the world. There were, there were a couple, couple people from Europe there. And, um, all of the ideas or most of the ideas really had to do with like making school less like school. And so the question that I asked that sort of got the last part of that going was, you know, why is that? And if that's how we all feel about it, why don't we just redesign the whole thing? And then I caught myself and I said, but hang on, uh, you know, and I've had this conversation with Jim Dunning multiple times, at least, at least once, maybe twice on the podcast um, is that you there don't want pieces. Wanna... There are pieces of it that work. Yeah, you and don't want to throw away. Don't. Yeah, it's I, like the, I didn't want to throw away the pieces that work well. Yeah, and, and that's like you know we can always be, well, and we can always be better with money. I, you know, everyone can, every institution can. But when you have public funding, when you you know mostly have public support, though that's been a little <laughs> that's been a little iffy lately. <laughs> but, um, We're not. I, you know, I don't yeah. know. But I don't know enough. To get yeah, no, we don't need it. We don't need to deal with that. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, you know, where you have you have real estate, you have buildings, you have all these facilities. Like, you don't want to throw that stuff away. But it's I a would. valid question to say, what can we do better with it, right? And if you're saying, hey, having access, to this was great. Having the funding to support, you know, the not just the the test, but maybe at least some of the class or the the materials, whatever it was that that helped get you there. We don't want to get rid of that stuff. But if a lot of the rest of what we're doing. I would say particularly in the younger grades, but it, it certainly carries on up through if, if there are elements of indoctrination or there are things that we think are limiting students options or removing creativity. Those are the things that we probably need to fix. My, my question to you, since you're sort of straddling that fence a little bit here is, is how much is baby and how much is bathwater? Like, are, are we doing a pretty good job and there's just some stuff that needs fixed or are we doing a pretty bad job and those other things left over are great? Like, how, how much how much of your experience in school has been sort of good versus bad? Like, what's that seesaw look like? Well, first, um, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to ask for the general consensus of it, just because, as you already said, my experience has been different than most. Oh, people. yeah, no, no, but of course. At least for me. Speak for yourself. But yeah, like, what, what is that? What does that balance look like? At least for me, I've made it work. Um, but that'd be like being in prison and you getting the best job to get internet privileges for an hour or for you to get TV <laughs> privileges for an hour. Or in my right. case, getting to at least for the better part of the year prior uh, to this past school year, getting to foray into faculty workrooms and uh, <laughs> cut across hallways. Right. Um, you know, so I, I've made it work for me. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I would have chosen to be in that environment if I had the choice to begin with. Um, I, I agree with you. I don't think we should throw it all away. But there are definitely pieces of it that we need to reconsider, um, if not rework at the very least, reconsider or consider why we do them in that way in the first place. Um, and so I'm kind of, I'm kind of getting into the gray area between this question and the ideal school question that I know you're going to ask me. Well, that's, that's um, where we're going. And, and, and maybe, maybe, but before you say what your ideal school would be, like, what would be on your, on your hit list? Like if you said, you know, there are some things we need to reconsider or, you know, do differently, stop doing before you tell me what you think we should be doing, what to you as a student who has just graduated from high school. Um, and as we've established, you know, very successful, sort of interesting, maybe unique experience, but the, the reason I want to ask you this is because you got to see it a little bit from different sides, right? Like you've had more professional sure. conversations with your teachers than most students ever do. Right. I, and I so what, what, what goes, you know, what are the things you would chop or, or reconsider redo altogether? I would redo. Uh, well, maybe not redo entirely, but I would at least reconsider how it is that we decide what graduating requirements are. And I would reconsider how it is we structure our school day in general, um, because the, the reality of it is, uh, if, if the end goal of high school is to prepare students for college, it doesn't work very well. Not that I think that should be the end goal, but if that's what we all claim that it is, which a lot of your colleagues happen to do, uh, it's not working very well. 
And so we should act accordingly to reflect that. Um, there's also an element of it that I think is very personal for some of your colleagues that maybe it shouldn't necessarily be so. Um, that isn't to say that they shouldn't be passionate about what they teach, but perhaps um, perhaps that passion would be uh, more suited for students who share it as opposed to students who are stuck in the class because they kind of have to be in this class to move forward. Yeah, I mean, the, the required pieces are definitely a, a concern. And I I think that probably, and, and it sounds weird to say, but the first time I ever gave that serious consideration was not when I was a student you know, probably at some point in college, I got frustrated with a prerequisite or a required gen ed class or something. But when I was teaching, I was, I don't know, a year, it was probably first or second year teaching. The My principal at the time was a former like music teacher. She was like the choir teacher or something. And and she was a principal and she was, she was a decent principal. It was fine. But she started talking about student engagement and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I'm sitting in a required English class and I'm not talking about like right. one of my higher level classes. I'm talking about a ninth grade general basic class, which we don't even offer anymore. I had kids ages 14 to 21 <laughs> who spoke seven or eight different languages. I had like six different diagnosed disabilities. It was, it was like crazy. That was my, it was, it was my first year teaching. It was a wild class. Right. And I was making it work. Like we were doing okay. I mean, you know, I would do better now, but it was, it was going all right. And she started talking about engagement and then it's, I said, she said, she said, well, my students used to, and I almost lost my mind. Like I was the first time where I was like, I have to shut up. She, all of her kids chose to be there. And to your point, right, right. when you're passionate and other people want to be there, that's great. But like, if I can be passionate about English class. I have to remember that, you know, most Not people are taking it because they have to be. Class, right. So I need to make sure that I deliver that appropriately. Um, I mean, do you think that that's a, that's a, something that should be addressed with teachers? Like, do you think teachers need to be reminded of the compulsory nature of their work or like, what do, I, I think yes. And well, I'm going to cover this next piece of what I'm going to say in, with the ideal school question, because okay. that's, that's where we keep heading. Yeah. You can roll um, right into it. That's the, fine. The, the short answer to the question you just asked me was yes. And I'll give you, um, well, I, I'm not going to name names out of courtesy, but <laughs> I was I was in a Facebook discussion with another teacher uh, talking about how their class, the class that they were teaching, uh, probably wasn't necessary for most of her students to be successful outside of school. Uh, and there were some... Uh, I'm sure some of her colleagues were not very happy with my statement, but they refrained from commenting on Facebook just because of the, just because of the fact that I was still a student at the time. Um, and I'm sure that this teacher probably wasn't the happiest after reading my comment either. Um, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed the class. I enjoyed the content area and I'm, I'm trying not to name it uh, to, right, to right. keep it, you know, confidential, if you will. Um, but there's a difference between liking the class and needing to use it later. Um, and, and so I was actually listening to an earlier episode of the uh, podcast earlier today with Sergeant Middleton uh, from yeah. episode five. Mm -hmm. I think it was, yeah, it was five. early on. It's yeah, probably five or six. Yep. And uh, I, there was something, there was something in there about um, the things that you use and not really knowing until you have to use it. Uh, yeah. But the reality of it is that there are certain things that, I mean, let's, let's put it to you this way. Um, I know there are certain things that I'm not going to have to sketch out on paper but that I'm not going to have to solve. I'm kind of giving it away here, but there are certain, there are certain things that I know I'm not going to have to do in the professional world right. um, that I only need to do for the sake of passing the class um, to get to the next one or to, um, I don't know, uh, study for the SAT to pass that section of the SAT, so on and so forth. There's certain things that I know that I'm not going to have to use or that if I do have to do it, there are tools that that can do it much more accurately, much faster than I could ever by hand. Right. Um, but I mean, it, it, is that is that a question, though, of the content? Like, I'm just thinking, as you said, this. I, it's a question about the mandatory and compulsory nature of it. Yeah. Well, because I'm, the folks that want to be in. 
Yeah. Well, well, I like think about, you know, you're about to go to basic training and think about like an obstacle course that you might have to run through. Sure. What's the likelihood you're ever going to have to put all of those skills together at the same time? You do it. You might have I, to I'm, do each of those things separately at some point, maybe. Right. But I'm not a- sure. I'm not sure. But the difference is I'm choosing to go through that. Well, right. I'm right. But what choice. I'm saying, though, is like with school, though, if, if we want to think of it, maybe like a lot of people do, you know, it's a lot of hoops to jump through. It's just do this to get to that class, do this to get to that class, get the numbers, get your GPA, get out of here, whatever. That's, in my opinion, it's a terrible way to look at it. But if we're going to say that's how some people are going to look at it, or it's too difficult to change the system, then it becomes a matter of designing a better obstacle course, right? Like if we're going to make you do all of these things, let's make sure that they're all actual skills that you're going to use. So whether you want to do it or not, A, by the time you're done this obstacle course, we know that these are functional skills. Do you think the compulsory nature of school would be less problematic if we were more careful in choosing what those required classes were? You know, like, let's say if in class you were allowed to use some of the technology that you would be able to do in a job. You know, if you were doing this in a professional setting, you might have some software or something else to help. Would Would the fact that you were forced to do it be less of an issue if we provided you with that same experience and the same software, you know, like is, is it that we've missed the mark and what the, what the tasks are, or is it just the fact that we're requiring it altogether? I think it's more of the fact that we're requiring altogether, because if I'm choosing to take that class or in my case, to go through the gates of hell at basic training, uh, at least I'm making the choice. And I, it, it's, um, uh, I was watching something the other day. I was watching, a. Uh, for a college class I'm taking online at the moment, I was watching a little roundtable discussion on ethics and uh, Justice Scalia said about the criminal justice system that we have in this country. Um, if you lose your case, at least you know it's your fault because you hired that lawyer, right? As opposed to an inquisitory system where you have an investigating judge, in which case the, the faith, your, your fate is kind of out of your hands. Okay. It's all up to whether you have a good or a bad judge. Here, you know, and, and the analogy is not perfect, but at least I'm making the choice to go through the gates of hell, or at least um, student A would be making the choice to go through that program and to use some of those tools and to go through kind of the required motions to be successful in whatever career path he or she or they chooses. Um, the way it is now, you have to go to school, whether you like it or not. You have to take X, Y, Z classes, whether you like it or not either because there's going to be short-term consequences um, in the elementary level, they're going to call mommy and daddy or in the high school level, you know, you're where we might also call mommy and daddy. You might (laughs) also call mommy and daddy, right? (laughs) It's a little Um, different. Yeah. But uh, you know, the the nature of the call will be different, but you're still calling mom and dad at the end of the day. Um, And at the end of the day, at least in high school, if you don't go through the required motions uh, and I don't know if there's an age cap or not, but at a certain point, I think when you've reached a f- legal adulthood, you can drop out entirely. Um, yeah, yeah. Right? I, I think that's true. Oh, no, you you can. I think the, the ages all used to be much lower. I think I think now you have to be like 17, I believe. 17, something like that. But yeah. And, I, and I, that, that isn't to say... Like 12. <laughs> but, yeah. That isn't to say that's a good option for you because your choices will be vastly limited by the fact that you don't have a high school education or, well, if you dropped out of high school and you don't have your GED, let's just put it to you this way, you're, you're kind of screwing yourself over. Um, but that doesn't mean that going through the compulsory nature of it was better either, mainly because you had to do it. At least if you right. drop out, you have the choice to be a bum uh, yeah. as, opposed to, as opposed to going through the motions and ending up a bum anyway. Yeah. Well, and, and some of that is, you know, it's not like one person makes the call, but some of that's self-inflicted. Like that's how I used to think a lot about um, like drug laws. I think it worked well as an analogy, like when the punishment for doing this thing or having this thing is actually going to negatively affect your life more than what you actually did. Like don't do drugs. Drugs are bad. Right. But if the penalty for doing the drug is actually going to mess up your life more than you doing it, 
like we've probably made a bad decision collectively right. as a society. And right, I think that right, sometimes right. that's where we end up with school. You know, the fact that somebody stops going to high school when they're 16 or 17 versus finishing at 18 doesn't really say that much about their abilities or their intelligence or their future goals or anything else. Um, and, and not but, that it's, but the lack of access that comes with that decision, all of a sudden right. is this major sort of, you know, and that, that is problematic. I mean, that's something we should probably wrestle more with. Um, there, there's a difference between dropping out of college and say high school, but being a dropout doesn't necessarily mean that you're any less bright than someone who is the valedictorian. Right. Uh, right. Just look to Bill Gates as an example. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and look at some of the other tech giants as examples of that. Um, but for I, I guess the difference then becomes a question of the high school versus college. Um, and let's face it, I think society as a whole has accepted the fact that you should probably be a graduate of high school or at least have the GED um, as kind of a benchmark, however effective that may or may not be Yeah. Uh, to be successful or to be at least functional. Yeah. I mean, I, I honestly wish there was less stigma around the GED program. I, I can... I obviously I won't name names, but I could, without any hesitation, I could rattle off the name of a couple dozen students who would have been well served to have been done with high school a year or two if, early and take the GED and move on. And we discourage it so very much that I, not, I wish we didn't. If not for the program that I was, the cybersecurity program at the academies of Loudoun, I probably would have done just that. Uh, I probably would have taken the GED. I would have been fine. And I would have signed the papers that said I'm enlisting and I would have been gone a year ago. Yeah. Um, but with that program came 18 free college credits. Um, so when you do the math, 18, because it was six college courses in a, in a school year, six college courses, three credits each. Mm -hmm. So when you do the math, 18 times 185 and change, I don't know what the going rate is, uh, but somewhere around there, you do the math, that's a lot of money that I'm saving. Mm -hmm. And then tack on the 1,000 or whatever, 1, yeah, and all the whatever certifications, yeah. right, from all the certifications. And that's a lot of money that I'm saving. That's not coming out of my pocket. So that's why I kind of stuck it out. And I said, okay, well, I might as well finish the thing. Or you know, at least you, I, even if we did that, like even if more students sort of thought about school like that, like what would you be paying for a comparable experience or, you know, the ability to learn and do these things somewhere else? But maybe to your point earlier about the dual enrollment stuff is if you don't have access to a lot of dual enrollment classes, then maybe 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 it's harder to do the math, or maybe it, there's not a direct a direct carryover between them. Um, so okay, well let's let's the, well go go ahead finish your finish your thought. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. The other thing that I'll just add to that, uh, I I will throw in one good thing about the way we're doing things now, uh, and it's the social aspect of it. I'll, when it first happened, um, again, the school year before last with the 15 minute uh, out of recess, whatever it is that you want to call it, yeah, recess, yeah, potty break, um, 15, whatever. Yeah, 15 minutes sort of break time. Yeah. You know, I, I was like, why are we doing this? This is stupid. This is dumb. And then I thought about it. I actually didn't think about this until the other day. But I was like, no, wait, that shouldn't just be 15 minutes. That should be an hour or two hours here. And, and so this is a good segue into the ideal school question. Is that mm -hmm. the next question you were yeah, going to yeah, ask? Yeah, yeah, okay. so, yeah. So my ideal school, um, and Greg, we could talk about whether school is ideal in general, but if we're talking about a school, right. I think the ideal school would probably be something more like college system where you choose a major or you choose some sort of focus or concentration to study. You choose the classes. You choose when you take these classes. And by virtue of that, you're probably also choosing which teacher or professor that you have for that class. You're choosing uh, how you would take it through what medium, whether that's online, like what you'll be teaching next year, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's online completely asynchronous, like what quite a bit of my college experience, in quotations, college experience has been like. Um, or whether you're choosing to take it in person, like we do the school system now. Um, and, and I so, and I know the mini series in season two, towards the end of season two, is about school choice. I don't know enough about that 
in terms of a policy perspective to say whether I'm really pro school choice or against it in, in the form that we talk about or the form that you were talking about in the policy perspective. Right. But what I will say is that students probably should have more choices in the classes that they take, in the subjects that they study, uh, and so on. And there might be some requirements of it, like, say, a literacy class here. Like, for instance, most of the, actually, I think all of the associates programs at NOVA require at least the English composition uh, one and two class. And mm-hmm. they require a math class of some kind. And they require a science class or two of some kind. And they require a history or social studies class and a humanities class. You know, there's certain, there's certain, those are probably good just as a general requirement, like a class from here to there. But we probably shouldn't have at least half of our schedule block for four years devoted to that. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you think about it, it's more than, it's more than half because you take your four core subjects plus foreign language, either, I mean, technically it's an elective, but if you're going to college, it's not. Um, And then you're going to have, you know, what is it? You have to take certain number of PE classes. You have to take health. You have to take a, you know, what is it? Everyone has to take like a personal finance and econ class. Right. Not right. that any of these things yeah. are necessarily bad ideas, but by the time you're done, it's m- way three quarters of your schedule is dictated, not not half. And, and moreover, and moreover, I'm not sure how much of it we use or if we do have to use it. I'm not sure how much of it we actually remember. Um, and, and, and this <laughs> yeah. is probably this is probably this. <laughs> this is probably more true about the personal finance class, sorry, personal finance teachers, but about the personal finance class than any other that I can think of, because I'll just give you, for instance, when I'm filling out a W-2 or whatever the, whatever the form is, like we go, or at least as part of the modules, mm-hmm. which are crappy, by the way, but that's just my opinion. The <laughs> modules in the personal finance class, can right. you tell I'm very opinionated about some of these things? Uh, I hear um, you. That's, that's the, why the, you're here. <laughs> the, 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 when we go through the modules for the personal finance class, yeah, they walk us through the form. They tell us what each of the boxes means and what we're supposed to do there. But by the time we actually have to seriously think about filling out that box and seriously think about what it means, that was four years ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't remember it. What was I supposed to do again? Oh, go, wait, I'm supposed to file taxes. What? I'm going to go. I'm going to go find a YouTube video. That's going to explain right? it to me again and, real quick. A YouTube video what most of my peers will probably do. Mom, dad, I need some help here. What am I supposed to do? Um, Or in my case, you'll be some sort of, um, I don't know, I don't know what the specific job would be, but some sort of naval counselor on a ship, or in my case, a submarine somewhere. Hey, I need some help here. What am I supposed to do? Or can you at least point me in the direction of someone who knows? Right. Right. Either way, by the time I actually have to seriously think about filling out that form, that was five years ago. Well, what was I supposed to do? It might yeah. be six years if you take it during your sophomore year. Um, and, Cause I know some people like to do that. What was I supposed to do with this form again? Oh, by yeah. the time, by the time I'm doing this, it's a different form altogether. Well, I yeah. And I mean, you, you don't, you don't retain a lot of that detail anyway. Um, and I, I, it doesn't mean no one does. I mean, I, I always say I have a sticky I'm, brain. I'm, like I can remember a bunch of this stuff, but you don't need it. And when it's time that you do need it, you, you know, probably you, look somewhere else to figure out what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even if you remember it, you're probably still going to double check. Right. So in, in your ideal school, then what would be required? Like, would you require instead of say having to do a science class three out of your four years of high school or do a math class? What is, is math three out of four? They might've made that four out of four. Uh, English yeah. used to be the only one might still be the only one you have to do all four years. Um, which obviously as well, an English teacher, I'm biased on, but I'm like, I, I would say everybody should be improving their ability to read and write and speak and communicate, but it doesn't mean you always have to do classic literature. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to do an AP and- class. Like, at least the way Loudoun County Public Schools does it now, you can kind of skate by without doing four years of high school math because you probably did one or maybe two in middle school with algebra one geometry. Right, so you right. can get away with it there. Uh, but at least for uh, English, you need to have all four years of English. Right. I'm not sure you need, you know, I'm not sure you need four full years of English because let's face it, um, I don't remember anything about Beowulf. I did not enjoy Beowulf. 
<laughs> um, I don't know how I'm supposed to use that in my everyday life. I don't know how I'm supposed to, You're not. to relate to that. Um, I could probably say the same thing about, um, oh, what's another one? I, I could probably say something similar about Romeo and Juliet. Um, mm-hmm. Although just, you know me personally, so you might disagree with me there. But I don't think all of us on the whole could say, oh, yeah, Romeo and Juliet every day. Now, there might be some cultural references that we miss just because it's, well, come on, it's Shakespeare. I'm, right. I'm sure most good writers, you know, have some sort of allusion to it in some of their works. But I mean, the, the, the point of it is that I'm not going to remember every single line from Shakespeare and I'm not going to remember um, the the technical requirements of, say, iambic pentameter or what have you. Um And so I'm not sure that we need to study those things as a required basis. I do think people need to write, or at least they need to know how to write. They need to learn how to speak. They need to know how to think. They probably should have some sort of sense with numbers. Um, And and I kind of picked up that mantra from you, actually, um, but it's probably true. You've said it before on some of the other podcast episodes. Um, So I'm going to quote you here. English isn't the class that gets you the job. It's the class that gets you the promotion, right? Yep, I'm yep. not misquoting you. Yep, absolutely. And I'll go back to what I said at the beginning of the episode with how I'm, how, or how I was the commanding officer of the delayed entry program uh, candidates. It's the fact that I can talk, that yeah. I know how to interact with the recruiters and the rest of the recruits, that I can, when the senior chief rolls by and says, show me what you got, I can show them what I got and I can deliver it in a way that's somewhat persuasive and that makes it look like I at least have an idea of what I'm doing, even though I might not have a clue. Um, <laughs> right. You know, so it, it, it's the, it, it's the class. It's the thing, if you will, that moves you up in the world. Um, right. But in terms of getting your foot in the door, I don't think I, as an IT person need to know the very specific things about American or British literature. Right. Um, and, and so I'm not sure that those aspects of it are required. That's in part why I liked the dual enrollment English class that I took, because the emphasis was more on actually being able to write. And granted, even then it was about writing specific types of essays, if you will, but just being able to write, to communicate with the written word and to express your ideas in that manner um, is probably important skill. Same with, same with public speaking. I know you used to teach that, and pro- though it wasn't the primary emphasis of the AP English language class that you taught, there were some elements of it um, that work well together with it, like the elevator pitch that we did. Right. Uh, All right. At least for basic math, I, I'm going to give kudos to the elementary school teachers here, which I don't do very often. Um, but the basic things that you must know how to do to, to be s- at least somewhat functional in the world that we're <laughs> right. living in you know, adding, subtracting, um, even things like telling time with the analog watch, which I have some serious doubts about my peers ability to do. But anyway, that aside, (laughs) um, those are the things that you learn early on. And I'm not sure that we need to know how to graph a a hyperbola. I'm not sure that you need to know how to take the area of a conic section. Uh, I'm not sure that you need to uh, know integration or derivatives to be successful in every trade or every profession that there is out there. Uh, just as a, for instance, I don't think there's a HR person who's taking the 15th derivative, if you will. Um, well, and, and, and also so, by that point, that isn't that an elective though? Like, haven't you chosen that, to take yeah, that math? That is true. But, I, but even for something like say algebra two, which is required um, for instance, algebra two trig. And I, I, the teachers at Broad Run who teach this class, I love dearly. So uh, if you, they are listening to this, I hope they don't take offense to it. But I don't think I need to know um, things like, say, how to graph the sine curve or the cosine curve to be a successful IT person. Right. And even that, and, and I guess even that's a bit of a stretch because there was a choice between, say, Algebra 2 Trig uh, versus the standard Algebra 2 class. But even with the standard Algebra 2 class, I'm not sure that I needed to know how to graph, say, a rational function. I'm not sure I, I needed to know uh, the specific mathematics of, say, how these factors cancel, how it creates a hole in the graph. 
to be successful in human resources or IT or so in culinary arts. Just, right? just for the sake of argument, though, at what point do we expect someone to know what they want to do? You, know, you say as an IT person, something like that, like you may figure that out much earlier on than a lot of other people did. At what point I, do we trust the student to make that call or, you know, I, I, we probably shouldn't even ask the question the, the parents are the parents and they should just be able to make these calls. But like, at what the, point the are parents, we comfortable specializing to that, to that extent? The parents, let, let's face it. I say this to my parents all the time too. Like they have influence on their children. No question about it. What I will tell you is that even adults probably can't answer that question uh, because if so, you wouldn't have so many college students switching majors and you wouldn't have so many people switching professions. Think about, Ryan, think about how many of your colleagues are career switchers, um, either into the teaching or out of the teaching profession. Yeah, and, and who switches and, and, into it? I mean, what are they thinking? That- <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, right. hey, some of my best teachers... Uh, from oh, yeah. Broad Run High School and before were career switchers um, in either direction. But the point being is that you have people who are in their 40s and 50s leaving successful careers in industry and are coming, you know, you know, who are going through these um, master's programs or um, certificate programs to get the licensure to teach. And, and, and I'm sure that's true in other industries too. Um, in IT, for instance, I know one of the big things about the IT industry um, that CompTIA likes to emphasize, or at least emphasize from what I've gathered, from what they've published online and on their social media, is that anyone can do this with the right skill set. It doesn't matter if you're 60 and coming from a career in, say, uh, I don't know, uh, automotive tech, for instance, or if you're coming from a career as uh, an artist and you want to become an IT person, anyone can do it with the right skills and with the right knowledge, right? right? And, and so... I'm not sure that's a reasonable question to ask because you still have people who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who are doing this. Well, maybe not 60s because they're approaching retirement. You know, they're they're approaching the time <laughs> where they can lucky, collect yeah. their tax dollars if they're lucky. <laughs> but the, the point being is that you have at least somewhat functional adults because they've survived for so long already making the same decisions as someone who is, say, 20-something in college switching majors or even the 17-year-old or 16-year-old who's saying, I want to be a doctor one day, and the next day I want to be a police officer, or I want to be the next congressman. Yeah, and I mean, and that's that's fair. Um, Now, Um, I'm I'm just thinking about as the overall sort of experience of it, like, let's say, let's say things continue as they more or less are now with compulsory courses and et cetera. We'll project, project to the future, I don't know, 20 years, 15 years, whatever you like. Um, I'll be collecting your tax money. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 20, Twenty years out. That's right. Um, but no, but think like you know, let if if you were to have children of your own, how oh comfortable how, well, how comfortable would you be with sending them to a school system like the one you attended? Well, since I, mean, I turned out okay with it, um, the odds are they'll probably turn out okay also. Uh, that might not be fair, but I'm just going to. Yeah, go no, with I that. just I, I always think um, that's that's one of those things when people, you know, say have and and you you walked the, the line there, I think, pretty nicely pointing out like what's good about it. But what what needs to change or where extra choice needs to be available that that's for me, that's a big part of it. You know, I think as a teacher, you know, when I moved to to Berryville, where I live, you know, you always look at the schools. And so my thing was right, like they right, just can't right, be right. awful. Like they don't have to be great. <laughs> They seem to be pretty good because we'll, we'll figure it out. We got a library, like we'll make up whatever we need to. But honestly, th- there's a I, degree of like that. That's a good test for like how serious are people about, you know, their their criticisms of any institution is how how willing or unwilling would they be to send their loved ones into that situation? So like, well, would, would you duplicate that process? Let's put it to you this way. I wouldn't sacrifice my children to the holy powers that be because I think school is an evil institution. But But I wouldn't, I think that's a choice for the child to make. And, and, and and I I can already see listeners. I can already imagine them wondering, what is this guy talking about? In what right mind would you say that a 10 year old has uh, the cognitive power or the worldly experience to make that decision? Um, Probably not. Uh, Probably not. But 
as silly as I think whatever decisions my children in 20 years might or might not be making are, I think those are their decisions to make. I will back them in whatever they choose, whether that means school, like, like Loudoun County Public Schools, or something like unschooling, which Jim Dunning, who's been a guest twice on the podcast, advocates, or whether it's something like, you know what, I've been doing this for so many years already, I just want to get my GED and get out of here. Okay, that's up to you. That's your, that, that'd be the choice of my children. Um, whether or not I have children is an open question, but for the sake, let's <laughs> right, just assume right. that I do. Um, that's a decision for them to make, not for me. But I made it, I made the system work to my advantage, at least to a degree. I, there are certain cases where it didn't quite work out the way I expected, but you know, for the, on the whole, it worked out for me. Um, And if that's the experience that my future children, that I'm not naming after you, but my future children (laughs) would like to have, hey, so be it. All right. I, well, now I've got something to think about here because what more can I contribute to your life so that we can have a little Tibbins tang running around like that's <laughs> that's good. No. All right. So, um, I mean, lots lots of good stuff there, and and there's a lot of things that you said that I think you you know that I already um, you already know that I agree with or or mostly agree with See, because I, I just I think I think that that element of of creating I've, the opportunity to specialize is really important how much or how little, you know, choice we have might actually be dictated by what we can staff or what we can fund. Um, but that, that's, have, that's the big missing piece. I think. I have only met one person in 13 years of public schooling and in 18 years of my life of which probably, you know, the first few, I couldn't remember Gilly squad about anyway, but again, just for, you know, just to make the point, in 18 years of my life and 13 years of public school, I've only met one person who has said, keep things the way that they are. And even then that was mainly for the social aspects. Uh, This person even agreed that there are probably certain things that we could do better, that it wasn't completely perfect, uh, but that on the whole, it was a decent system. I've only met one person who's ever said that. And even that was an acknowledgement, at least enough for me to say, yeah, even this person who likes public school and the way it is thinks that there's probably a thing or two that we could change to make it better. Right. Uh, I've yeah. never met someone who has said, yes, keep everything exactly the way it is. <laughs> it is superior in every which way. I've yeah, I mean, I've, 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 I've had a couple, you know, on, on the show who have said mostly keep it the same. And that's usually when, you know, you say, hey, what's your ideal school? And they say, I don't know, I just fewer tests, <laughs> you know, and they're like, they'd get rid of standardized well, testing. I'm like, well, that's since you, well, you know, I, I'm not sure that's a great answer. Um, not to diss any of your, any of your other guests, but I'm not sure that's a great answer. And, and maybe this is maybe part of this is related to what my future career is in the military, but at least in the military on the enlisted side, you still have to take tests. <laughs> yeah. and, and for the, for the greater, I mean, for at least the first probably six months to a year, you still have to go to some form of schooling um, in the Navy called a school or C school, whatever. Uh, but you still have to go to some form of school. You still have to take some form of test, even at basic training. Uh, there's tests that I'm going to have to take on the knowledge that I ideally should know going there. But the reality of it is um, that while I know it, most of my peers probably won't, at least not off the top of their heads like I do. Um uh, not, not to toot no. my own horn or to, uh, you know, <laughs> no, but, no, I, I, I know what you mean though. And that, so you, that's going to carry forward. That's, that's part of what that, that conversation with Brandon Middleton was about, which you said you were listening to um, is, is how some of these study skills and some of these things really did carry forward in ways he didn't expect. Right. Um, right. You know, and, I, and, I, I wouldn't toss the tests entirely. Uh, you know, I think that's a place where you can make changes and make improvements. But, you know, that that's usually a quick sign of, I say, if you can make any change you want, the person says I'd get rid of or reduce standardized testing. I'm like, man, you, you're really thinking inside the box there pretty tightly, you know, that you're going to change that, that one sort of end point piece. Um, But you know, either either way. Oh, go ahead. I'll even just add that even in like the IT industry, I still have to take tests to get the certifications in the first place. It's not a project that I'm doing that says, oh yeah, it's good. You get a certification. There's a test. Right. I have to take a test. It's not a project. Uh, and so that's something else that I've picked up on just 
yeah, granted, I've listened to 70 some odd episodes of the Class Cast podcast. Um, so I'm kind fan. of pulling in pieces <laughs> from all the episodes here, but that's something else that I picked up on, which is that there was a lot of, you know, we should abandon the test and go for the project, or at least we should reduce the amount of tests and do more projects. Um, and just my own personal opinion about that is that I would much prefer the test over the project because I don't have to do anything other than take the test. Someone else like you or one of your colleagues has already got questions in mind that they want to ask. And as long as I study whatever it is they tell me to study, I will probably do fine on the test. Well, that's one of the reasons I don't people have push to for work the project, though. The project. It's because it's because the test is easier, you know. And by the way, I I think I think personally, I think there should be both. I don't think we should do all projects because that's incredibly that time consuming be, and frustrating and whatever else. I don't think we should do all tests because there's a lot of a lot of those soft skills or power skills, uh, you know, that you you don't learn how to interact with others. You don't learn how to problem solve. You don't learn how to delegate and all that stuff but, by taking a test. But even then, I'm not sure that that comes out on a rubric of a project either, especially when most of your rubrics come out to be, did you, um, did you, I don't know, did you cover this piece of the content? Did you address this other piece yeah. of the content? Did you include citations, uh, whatever, right? I'm not sure. And what was it that um, I think it was Joe Pizzo mentioned? Power yeah, that skills. Was, that was, was the it? power skills. That's, power skills. Yeah, I, was I about like to give that. Him credit. Yeah, I like that. Uh, that power skills is an awesome way to put it because I like him. I don't. I, the term soft skills is like yeah, okay. That yeah, that makes it, me it makes think of like secondary. the touchy feely stuff. Yeah. Um, which yeah, you know, but I've, even that even that though is is really tricky because when as you get into you know this push for like standards based grading and mastery grading. Yeah, there, there are no state standards on your ability to work well with others. And, and so technically, if you really want to follow the, the rule and say it, what, you can't even grade on that. Like right. you can be the biggest jerk. You could get along horribly with your, your partners. You'd, in the end, and, if you demonstrated the knowledge and skills, then I, hey, boom, you get the grade. Not, not I, to I diss don't know any if that's good either. Not to diss any of your colleagues, but some of them probably aren't the best at those power skills either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm no, just, no, it, I'm entirely valid. point. <laughs> I, as you made, as you made very obvious from the get go, I have worked with probably 200 of your colleagues. There are probably more of them, but I'm just going to throw out the number 200. And I've worked with probably at least on a given point, probably 500 or so of the 1500 students, even in things like, you know, when one person comes into the tech office and I'm there, or if I'm helping out in this class or that class, uh, and there have been teachers who have gone down to the tech office and demanded me at that instance when I was in another teacher's class, that has happened before. Yeah. Um, that, which take that for what you will. Um, but I'm not sure that most of your colleagues, Ryan, are the best at those power skills. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not <laughs> sure that we That's... should be doing things to grade those or at least to encourage those to use those when most of your colleagues well maybe most isn't fair but at least some of your colleagues aren't doing and themselves. probably the ones who are going to do those things aren't doing it themselves yeah yeah no so, and, and that's you know man that, that's that's a good idea though to do like a professional development session for teachers that's not about a new software it's not about yeah some new it's like it's I've, like this is how we work well with others. And, this is how we like, and everybody would be upset about it, but like, and you know, by the pr way, principal should just go down the list and be like, here's my 20. I'm sending these 20 people there. <laughs> I don't care if they like it or not. Like I, they need I, it. And I've sat through some of your professional development, at least for the technology stuff. And uh, I, I was thinking to myself, again, not to diss any of your colleagues, but I was thinking to myself, I could think about 10 different ways, if not more to do this better or more effectively. And probably in a way that, A, I would have been happier because I wouldn't have had to either circulate around the room to make sure that you, the teachers, weren't being crappy students um, oh, and doing and, the same things we, that you tell the rest of us not to do in are, class. And we are. Teachers you are. are the teachers I, are the I, worst should, audience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys are the worst students. I tell you guys that all the time yeah. um, because I see, it in the, <laughs> I see it in the PD. I see teacher A checking email. I see teacher B making their lesson for tomorrow. Um, and because I know because I'm in that teacher's class. Um, yeah. And so, I, you know, I see it all the time. Um, and, and, then I'm, I, and then I'm like the bad cop. 
I'm, I'm like the bad cop and uh, whoever's leading the training, that tech training might be the good cop. I love, uh, because I love, I'm the one who's walking around the room and like, hey, maybe you should be paying attention to this sure, or, sure hey, this is something that you were asking me about uh, the other day. This would be a good time to pay attention, right? Things like that. Uh, and and I, I could think about 10 different ways to make those effective where I don't have to walk around the room Oh because well, I mean, you want to be there. The, you, you've just hit on one of my biggest complaints is that all the stuff we say we want students to do or how we want teachers to teach students, almost none of that finds its way back into professional development for teachers. You know, like, well, I can and, think I can think about one of the trainings you're talking about where you were circulating around the room and someone else is leading it. And I started paying attention. And I was like, well, this is going miserably slowly. And I so I did some other stuff for we, a while and then I sort of tooled around with it. Like we probably man, spent about a good minute to a minute and a half talking about how to properly say the name of the tool. Yes, um, yes. And and it also it also would <laughs> at, at least that much. But that also would have been a good time for a little independent, like asynchronous work or a little project based here, thing. Like, go do this, build at, this, right. make this. And, and I think there was even a video on how to say it, right? But anyway, that that aside, <laughs> that, that yeah, aside, we, you get the point that I'm saying, which yeah, is that we, we don't we don't we use, don't do it very well. No, and and that that gets to well, I'm not going to go down. That's a whole rabbit hole. Like I have a whole big complaint about the way we train teachers on things, and on what we require the teachers to do. But at least we're being paid, and we chose the job, so that's I'll, that's maybe I'll, okay. I'll start digging this kind of catch it back up dirt if you'd like. But I think part of the fact that folks are teachers, they come to school, whether they come or come back to school or they never left school, be like school. They liked it in the way that was went to school. If they I don't know if teacher Z comes to this area and likes the school system and decides to teach, they like it for whatever reason. They like the system the way it is, or they never left the system at all to begin with. Um, because let's face it, college is really you know, I mean, college. I mean, I know I was advocating for that as a better system than what we have now, um, but in essence, you're still in academia yeah. in some prof- in some way, well, and, shape, or form. And that's fine. But yeah, no, that that when when most of the people in a school did well in school, it treated them well, and it's led to decent outcomes, then, you know, you're not always asking the right people how to right. change it, you know. The, the- and and, and I, I don't know if that makes it even more ironic that some of the, some of your colleagues are, are the worst students <laughs> in true. these PDs. Uh, but the, I, I think a lot of the, I think there are issues with school that stem from the fact that the people who are in the schools are the ones who liked it growing up. Right, and that in some cases right. never left, and in uh, in probably just as many or maybe slightly fewer cases came back. Yeah. All right. Here's what we gotta do. I got I got a couple of questions I want to ask. We're gonna do rapid fire thing, and then I just I just saw the time. I'm like, hey, we gotta we're gonna wrap this up here soon. But um, we always end with the book and movie recommendations. Before we get to that, though, um, here's something I want to do, and this this might be unfair. So if you don't like any of them, you're allowed to say pass. Okay. But, I'm going to, I'm going to, and this is random. I, I don't This better not be a name, your favorite teacher. And no, no, no. We Ryan all know Patrick it's okay. We already know that it's okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to say like, did this happen or did you do this or would you do this or something like that? And okay. I want you to give me like a yes or a no or whatever. No big explanation. So just sort of like quick, simple stuff. Uh, okay. Since we're getting the perspective of a recent graduate from, okay. you know, of school. Um, so online uh, synchronous online classes, is this something that we should or should not continue offering? We should continue offering, but we should also offer asynchronous online. Okay. Um, do you think that there was a significant loss in learning for high school students over the last year and a half? Do you, do you think most people lost a ton of stuff or it was comparable? No. And even if there was, I think it would have happened either way. Okay. Um Let's see. What else? Uh, have you? Oh, <laughs> for the you, for the reasons that I described earlier. Really, really yeah. Would have happened either way. Uh, do you not not saying did this happen to you or anything like that? But do you have concerns about the way we teach things related to equity or race or whatever else? Like we're hearing everybody go crazy for or against or whatever. From the student perspective, is this a, a serious concern? I have questions and I have doubts. 
about the efficacy of what we do and the efficacy of what we propose to do. Okay. So, so, so whether we should or shouldn't do it, it's not working anyway. <laughs> I don't think it's, I don't think what we're doing now is working. And I don't think what we're proposing to do would work very well, if at all, either. Okay. Um, how, what, what, this one isn't like yes or no so much, but um, what percentage of your learning do you think took place in the actual academic setting in the classroom versus in all the other things going on around the building, whether it's your work in sort of that para position or extracurriculars, you know, athletics, band, whatever, what percentage of your learning in high school actually took place in classrooms? Uh, I think that depends on what aspect of it we're talking about. If we're talking about the trade as an IT none of it. Well, well, no, I take that back quite a bit of it, but not as a student, more as a visitor to the room, assisting in X, Y, Z capacity okay. or in the, or for the past school year online at home at my desk with the same virtual zoom background. Um, <laughs> uh, if we're talking about socially uh, parts of it, but, um, Again, I think most of the social aspects of what I know now, I've learned outside of the classroom, but bits of it I've gotten from the classroom. Things like, you know, probably it isn't a good idea to just walk out of the uh, teacher's classroom. Um, it probably isn't a great idea to uh, criticize the teacher to their face uh, in front of the rest of the student population in the class, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's useful. Um, okay, <laughs> how much should I be paid each year? I don't know. I think that depends on a lot of things. Um, if I no, were no, no, if, no, no, no big explanations. Decision, I want a dollar figure. How much am I worth? <laughs> I think you should get a raise. Appreciate um, that. How much did the average teacher get paid? <laughs> I honestly don't know. Yeah. I honestly do not know. Well, that, um, I, I, I phrase it that way because that, that gives the, you know, you could be like, you deserve a raise and you say, how about the average teacher? You'd be like a much bigger raise. And then we know where I stand. That's good. <laughs> you deserve a raise because you're awesome. Um, but I don't know. I don't know how much of it. Um, well, who is it? There was someone on the um, Edgepodlooza episode. Uh, it was the French lady who was mm -hmm. talking about getting her money's worth in her classes. Right. Um, right. I'm not sure how much of my money's worth through tax dollars or how much of my parents' uh, money through tax dollars am I getting out of some of your colleagues? Right, right. But yeah, well, not name, but some of them. No, yeah, there, there's always the quality control issue. So so let's let's get some recommendations. What are you into? Books and movies. Um, books, anything Malcolm Gladwell. Um, I'm willing to debate anyone about which of his books is the best. I've read them all with the exception to the latest one, The Bomber Mafia. I haven't gotten a chance to read that yet. Uh, I will say that I like Outliers um, and I like Blink. Blink because it was the first Malcolm Gladwell book that I read. Outliers probably because it's the better one of all of them. I'll tell you that my not the most favorite um, is probably Talking to Strangers, probably because it was more different than the rest. Um, not a bad book, but different than the rest and more charge there's a more exigence to it if you will yeah definitely um, de definitely definitely darker than the other yeah. books um yeah yeah that i mean that you know i don't remember if you actually use it for my class or not but i i had i, I did use options. that one i did use that one for your class yeah and there was another choice by i think it was Catherine Scholes. Um, oh being wrong being, being wrong, wrong. Yeah. i liked that one too that one was actually a lot like malcolm gladwell's um, in terms of uh, the stylistic choices and, and such, it was very yeah. similar, which he's I like. He's it's sort of cherry picking your evidence and all that. The um, by the way, I haven't mentioned this since probably a podcast episode right after school shut down, but I remember sort of setting up this this sort of unit on being wrong, you know, and I had four right. or five books right. Right. that all had something to do with how we sort of misjudge things, or whatever. And I remember in I don't remember which class it was in, might might have been yours. But I remember a couple of students asking me about, what do you think about this coronavirus? And, you know, do you think they're <laughs> going to shut down schools and all this stuff? And I was like, well, I hope we they... Were I, I think like, we were all wrong. In our oh yeah. Well, but I was like, I was like, it sounds, it sounds bad, but it doesn't sound that bad. And I was like, my concern is people are going to get nervous. They're going to shut down schools too early. 
And then we're going to end up I, having to come back and they're going to make us make up school time over the summer because of blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I think it was literally like two or three days later, <laughs> school shut down and we weren't back in the building for, you know, almost a year. <laughs> yeah. I honestly thought when they were planning to open it up back in, uh, well, actually, because I, th I think there was some plans, there was some talk about opening it in the fall of the 2020 to 2021 school year. Right. And that happened for the elementary kids and for some of the academies of Latin programs. Uh, would that at least that's my understanding of yep. all of the events that transpired. And I was like, you know, no, it's, I mean, they're going to go back to school. And then a couple of weeks later, they're going to be sent back home. And I was saying the same thing in March. We're going to go back. It'll be a week or two, and then we're going to be sent back home again. And I was completely wrong yeah. about my predictions. Yeah, I just, um, I, yeah. I just loved that. Uh, you know, I'm like, hey, here are all these books about being wrong. And then I had this talk, you know, at the class, and then I was like, oh, and I was miserably wrong, so, you know. And I, I did a podcast episode about it, sort of. Explain, I'm like, hey, I was wrong, and the books are actually useful in thinking about it. I, but. I will say that if you, if you like to think about it that way, I'd highly encourage you to think about the differences between blink and talking to strangers. I feel like they're, uh, they're the opposite sides of the coin. Whereas blink, we're talking about the value of the snap judgment yep. and the fact that our intuition is usually right. At least in certain contexts, most of the time talking to strangers is the opposite. It's, yeah. it's, it's almost like a self refutation, if you will. Um, yeah, that, wait like a minute. Maybe we ought to rethink that. Um, and, and maybe, granted, maybe I'm not as good as I thought. And maybe there's a, and maybe the fact that there's probably what a good 10 to 13 year time difference between the two says something, uh, mm -hmm. either about Malcolm Gladwell or about how we've evolved as a society, or maybe both, probably both. There's a, uh, but there's I, a good I, university level paper the in there somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So we got, we got Gladwell, a mention of being wrong. Anything else? Um, for uh, I've been told that the hunt for red October, both the book and the movie is good. I haven't read either uh, the book or watched the movie. So I don't know, but I've been told that I need to watch it considering I'll be on submarines in the Navy. That's my duty assignment. I remember um, reading, I started the book. It's a really long book. I started reading it in like middle school and it was a little <laughs> too technical and a little too long. And I gave up at some point. The, the movie is really good. And the book was, I don't remember. It was okay, but I know I didn't finish it. The movie has Sean Connery, so you know. I, how can you go wrong? Uh, um, as as for other movie film recommendations, you know I don't watch movies too much. That's been a point that has caused much distress amongst so many other people that I've talked to, because I don't know X Y Z cultural references. I don't get why. Uh, I, I, for instance, don't understand why Endgame. The Avengers Endgame is such a big deal, and the Infinity War <laughs> movie is such a big deal. And so when I when I talk to people, now granted, I did watch, uh, I did watch. Was it? I care which one came first, Infinity War or Endgame. Infinity um, War then Endgame. So I watched Infinity War, and I thought it was great, but I didn't understand anything of what happened there. Because I hadn't seen any of the previous like twenty some odd movies. Yeah. Great movie, I just didn't get any of it. And and so when pe when I tell people that was my first one, they're like, "What are you doing, dude? You're missing like 20, 20 films and probably forty solid hours of of film there." And I'm like, you know, whatever. This was a free movie ticket. Yeah. I wasn't going to pass up on it. I was. Uh, so that's I was never. Movie. I was never into them either until I, my kid got. I, I, he's probably arguably still not old enough to watch them, but you know his friends at his preschool all got into Avengers. So I've now seen all of them. And, but I know I know what you mean because with the the finger snap, there are all the memes about the finger snap, and I'm like, I don't get it. The finger I, I snap. Yeah. The the stones. Yeah, I, mean, I had I no idea what was I, going on. Yeah. So great movie. <laughs> I didn't carry but I, it for a while. Great movie, but I didn't understand any of it. Um, okay. Apart from that, um, James Bond, uh, because I've been watching James Bond since I was a little kid. I don't know if that says something about my parents or myself or both, but I like watching James Bond movies. I'll continue to watch them. Um, and, and besides that, I don't really know much about movies. I do know a lot about television, um, C-SPAN call me old but i watch c-span i love watching c-span um and 
a lot of my classmates used to have inside jokes about calling me Grandpa Simone about it and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but I like watching C-SPAN. Uh, for other forms of enjoyment, uh, as opposed to getting some form of news in my brain, um, I like watching JAG. I don't know if you've seen that, uh, mm -hmm. but it has David James Elliott and Catherine Bell opposite each other in it. Great TV show from uh, that, that was running from 95 to 05 um, about the judge advocate general Corps of the United States Navy. Great show. Um, that was what created the NCIS universe. If you've ever oh, gotten into yeah, NCIS. Yeah. So NCIS is a spinoff of JAG. Did not know that. And then NCIS Los Angeles and New Orleans are both spinoffs of the original. Do you watch all of these shows? Is I do. I watch okay. all of them. You and watch, so, you're into the alphabet shows. I call them alphabet I, shows. Yes. My I've parents the really like them. Shows. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And, and, <laughs> I have a couple and, friends who watch them too. And NCIS Los Angeles is connected to uh, Hawaii Five O, which is connected to the new Magna PI reboot. So that universe is huge. It's almost as big as the Dick Wolf Law and Order uh, universe, which I've also been to. I think the original... The original and the latest one, Law and Order Organized Crime, are top notch. You know what's um, going to happen? You're going to end up being a lawyer. You're going to go through all this IT stuff. You're going to be in the Navy. You're going to you're going to you're going to be a JAG. That's what you're going to be. That's what's going to so, happen. <laughs> you I know, see, I was I, I was flirting with this idea because the Navy actually does have a program that takes its enlisted people and gives them an opportunity to get a law degree and become part of the JAG Corps. And I was I was actually doing some serious research into that the other day. But anyway, that that make me one of the career switchers, just like everyone else, which That's isn't right, a bad man. thing. But, you know, uh, yeah, I was I was looking into that. I love um, it. But anyway, uh, back to TV shows. I'll try to make this quicker. Um, Law and Order, Law and Order, the original Law and Order mm -hmm. and Law and Order Organized Crime. They're both really good. SVU is OK. It's not my favorite of the entire universe um and the law and order universe is connected to the chicago universe uh so that'd be like chicago bed chicago pd chicago fire isn't that just like a whole night of like yeah, and well <laughs> you know it's so <laughs> like wolf, four hours of just dick wolf has chicago a monopoly on tv because on tuesday nights at least for this coming fall season of primetime television it's all going to be FBI. So FBI, FBI Most Wanted, FBI International. Those are all Dick Wolf shows that are connected to the Chicago shows, which air on Wednesday night, uh, <laughs> which is the Chicago Man, Chicago PD, Chicago Fire, which is connected to the Law and Order universe, where you have Law and Order SVU and Law and Order Organized Crime on Thursday. And, and by the way, by the way, the FBI shows are all in the CBS they're all CBS produced and the Chicago shows in the law and order. They're all NBC. So not only do you have a monopoly on three nights of primetime television, but you also have it across two different networks, two networks, uh, this, which this guy, this guy has it all figured out, <laughs> which, which take it for what you will, but I'm like, Oh my God. And, and, and moreover, it bumped NCIS, which is, I prefer NCIS over the FBI shows. It bumped it from its Tuesday night slot at 8 p.m., which I used to watch religiously for years, to Monday nights at 9 p.m. Not that it, not that I'll be able to watch it at boot camp or on a submarine anyway, right. but that that's still a bit annoying. To me. But anyway. <laughs> um, Oh, I love it. I love oh. it. I imagine you just like spending your whole evening like with like a lineup. You're like looking. You're like you are. You're you are you are an old man. That's what it is. You're sitting there with your TV guide, scheduling out your programs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, like... you know, it's it's gotten to the point where there's so many shows that I have to choose which ones. But I'll tell you, at from for the past two months, and well, not during the school year when I was at home, but <laughs> maybe maybe on the DL. From 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock, Monday through Friday, on WGN America, now known as News Nation, I think. Um, I, I watched reruns of JAG for two hours, Monday through Friday. I've been doing that for the last month or so, you know, enjoying my last taste of freedom before I leave for the gates of hell. Like, yeah. I will religiously go to the TV with my bowl of cereal after a, I don't know, after on average a six or seven mile run every morning. Yeah. With my bowl of cereal or some other breakfast watching Jag on the television. 
I love it. I love so, it. So anyway, Simon uh, in uh, his robe and bunny slippers watching the reruns <laughs> of the crime show some morning. It's good. <laughs> so that's my that, that's that was a lot of television and not so much book. Um, but I, I'll wild. go back that's to good. book just for a moment. Mike Myers, if you're interested in some of the IT certifications like the A plus network plus security plus and some of the others, Mike Myers and total seminars are great resources for that. Um, there are several he has so many different editions of each of those books, but um, most of those are published by McGraw Hill and they're like the all in one um, certification prep stuff. Mm -hmm. Professor Messer also has some good stuff. It's not necessarily books, but it's a collection of videos and uh, I guess um, cheat sheets or uh, I, I don't know what, I don't know what Test his prep guide. Something yeah. Like that, something yeah. like that. Um, so that's good stuff too. Um, yeah. As for the open mic, um, I, I, I gave, Ryan, you might think I'm being a bit redundant here because I gave this speech to some of your students, but I realized that most of your listeners aren't your, aren't, are also, most of your students are probably not your audience listening to this. this. So true. I'll say it again. Um, life is about, life isn't about the things you don't do. It, it's about the things that you do do. Uh, <laughs> do do. You said do do. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, can you see why we got along so I love much? It. Other, By in the way, other I, words, I hit my five-year-old son with that the other day, and he didn't—he didn't get it. And then I explained that he said "doo doo," and he goes, "Oh!" And he laughed. He goes, "Oh, I did say doo doo." I was like, "Yeah, yeah." yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm sorry to those who have to listen to this. Um, um, in other words, uh, you know, seize your defining moment whatever that is for you, because it's going to be different for everyone, but whatever that is for you, whether that's the certifications, whether that's military enlistment, like it was for me, seize your moment uh, because you're never going to regret the stuff that you did. It's always going to be the stuff that you didn't do. It'll always be the what ifs. So Ryan, you were saying, and maybe I got some of this from you too, but when you used to tell me in your class, you should go to the homecoming. You should go to the prom. And I still think those are terrible, but for different, uh, for, for other reasons, <laughs> right. I, I still hate those types of events. Um, you know, it's probably the same reason why I stuck it out for as long as I did in the public school system, because it gave me the opportunity and I decided to seize it instead of let it go. Um, and in terms of the social aspects of school, which we didn't talk much about um, tonight or, well, maybe we did in certain, in certain yeah, capacities, but- um, it, I took away, what I took away from public schooling was more about social aspects than it was all the book smarts up here, right. uh, which is ironic because most of the people who know me will say, you're not social. You don't know diddly squat about being social. Um, but, you know, things like, I don't know, this will sound juvenile and childish, but things like asking the girl out or, uh, which, uh, which by the way, there, there are some things I've written about that for class, uh, which might also make me interesting. But anyway, um, things like that or things like, you know, having the guts to walk into the faculty workroom, um, cutting into the mail room, used to do that almost every day. But anyway, um, you know, it, it's all about those pieces. Those are the pieces that you take away from it. Uh, or at least those are the things that I've taken away from public schooling um, and at least, uh, you know, with my personal relationships, Ryan, I think you and I have a decent personal relationship and a professional one in terms of school and in terms of uh, the teacher student relationship, which granted I kind of cloud a lot of the time, but, um, but uh, you know, things like that. Those are the most important pieces that I took away from my public schooling experience. And even in one of the, in actually in a couple of the photos that I sent you, there's a photo of me crossing the finish line at my first marathon. And there's another photo of the running crew that I'm running with. And Ryan, I think you can recognize at least one of the faces there as one of your colleagues. Um, oh, who, who I, I have to look closer. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's the personal relationships that I have with you, Ryan, and with a couple of your colleagues in particular um, that I really took away from public school. Um, more so than any of the book smarts. Yeah. And, and I think that that is probably true for a lot of people. Um, and if we're willing to acknowledge that, then that 
hopefully hopefully gives people the the freedom or the courage to say we can do some of it differently right if, if and, most of us reflect back on school and we think about all those other things we're doing outside of the classroom or or they're in the classroom but they're only incidental to what we're actually supposed to be learning um that that's probably a pretty good indicator that that we have more flexibility in terms of changing the learning if we want to you know and 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 maybe maybe that's a good uh you know see, seize the moment kind of thing you say hey we have this chance to do something different and if we're being honest the stuff we want to change isn't what most people are remembering first anyway um it creates that freedom seizing the moment is also as you alluded to earlier why i decided to go to my own high school graduation and by the way a lot of your colleagues uh, particularly in the math department but a lot of your colleagues were very upset with me when i said and granted part of it was my delivery um it was in a meeting similar to this but on yeah. google meet which uh, yeah, google meet whatever but google yeah. meet uh in a math lab google meet it was like a uh, or actually i think it was office hours but anyway yeah. It was like, a, ah, ah, right, right, great. Because there was the class sponsor was talking to me about the graduation, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, okay, sounds great, blah, blah, blah. Sounds and, good. You know, yeah. I, and and I, think, I think they kind of caught the drift. And uh, there was some outrage. There was some outrage um, that I was not going. Yeah. Um, and one of the teachers who was in, in this classroom was very very passionate about why i should go um and another one of the teachers said you know i'm a stubborn son of a gun uh but you know i finally came around to it and i didn't realize it you know at the moment yeah it probably would have it probably was a good decision but i didn't really recognize that until that day when the ceremony that was moved from 7 to 6 p.m moved back to 7 and then was it was broken up into four smaller ceremonies because of the thunderstorms yeah. uh, and such that were in the area. And granted, this ceremony was supposed to take place outside. Uh, yeah. Just for other listeners who might not be aware of the situation of June 10th in Ashburn, Virginia. That, <laughs> it was, it was uh, a mess. <laughs> so, <laughs> then he pulled it off. Yeah. But yeah. Seizing, you know. seizing the moment up till the very end. That's probably the biggest takeaway that I've gotten from public school followed very closely by some of the social pieces of it. Right. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, uh, well, I tell you, I, I said you could do the start of the close. You want to, you want to end this thing? You, you did the intro. You set up a couple of your own questions there. You want to, you want to wrap it up as well? Is that. Oh dear. Um, I don't know about the social media handles. I'll let you do that, but Ryan, this has been awesome. Thank you for having me on the ClassCast podcast. Um, I think you can find the ClassCast podcast on Twitter at ClassCastPod and ClassCast podcast on Facebook um, and was it ClassCastPodcast.com for the website? Yep, Something yep. Something like that. That's right. Um, this has been the 70 whatever episode. I don't know if you've had any other episodes. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'm still sorting it out. Probably seven. We'll see. 74, 75, something like that. This has been the 70 something episode of the Class Cast podcast. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much for having me. Have a great day. Hey, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Awesome, man. All right. Well, thank you.